This episode is brought to you by Epic Loot Jewelry. Get one-of-a-kind pieces inspired by Norse culture at epiclootshop.com. Link is in this video's description. What is going on, my fellow Norse nerds? My name is John Solo, and I love dogs. Fat or skinny, smart or dumb, they're all incredible in their own special way. But what may be the most incredible thing about dogs as a species is that every single breed you know has a wolf ancestor. That's right. Even this one. I am not exaggerating when I say I think about that fact multiple times a week when I stare at this loaf of bread. So combine that with the premiere of Disney's new Loki series and you can understand why Fenrir has been on my mind lately. See, Fenrir, or Fenris Wolf, is the son of Loki according to Norse mythology, and he is a terrifying force to be reckoned with. When he opens his jaws, the top of his mouth is said to touch the sky while his lower mouth touches the ground, and the prophecy states that Odin, king of the Aesir, will be devoured in his giant maw. Fenrir plays a very important role during Ragnarok as well as a supporting role in Thor Ragnarok. So I thought we could have some fun today by comparing the two versions to see how many similarities and differences in their stories we can find. Before we dive into it though, I do want to say thanks to this week's sponsor, Epic Loot Jewelry. So you may have noticed that I'm in floss mode for this episode, meaning that I'm rocking some next level Nordic bling. Well, I'm excited to say that's courtesy of our sponsor, Epic Loot Jewelry. They specialize in selling unique pieces directly inspired by the history of and symbology found in Viking culture. Just take a look at some of the items they sent me. We've got the Thor's Hammer Viking Tankard, which is now tradition for me to use whenever I'm working on content for Norse Mythology Explained. I also may or may not be sipping some of Midgard's finest mead from it right now. <sighs> it's 10 a.m. by the way. This king chain with the wolves holding me all near is also one of my favorites, and I love this bracelet designed to look like Jormungundr wrapping himself around Midgard. Almost as much as I love explaining who he is to strangers who compliment him, I always manage to blow their minds. Oh, and do you know this Viking longship that I have in my background sometimes? It's also from Epic Loot, and it's an incense burner, so you can really change a room's whole vibe with this thing. Not only does Epic Loot offer limited edition designs that you can't get anywhere else, but their commitment to quality means every single one of their products is built to last, just like the Norse myths were. And in honor of our episode on Fenrir, not only can you get a discount on several pieces in their Fenrir collection, but if you enter code JOHNFREE at checkout, you'll get free shipping on your entire order. Links to their website and specifically to their Viking longship and Fenrir collection are down below. And without further ado, it's time to get started. If you haven't already, be sure you like and subscribe to get more content like this in your recommended feed and sub box every week. And now, the messed up origins of Fenrir. So depending on who you are and what sounds you like to make with your mouth, you may also know Fenrir as Fenris Wolf, a name that stems from his Old Norse name, Fenris Ulfur. According to Old Norse specialist Jackson Crawford, Fenris Ulfur translates to the Wolf of Fenrir. However, in true Norse fashion, Fenrir also has two additional epithets, Hrothvitnir, which means famous monster, and Vanagander, Monster of the Van, a name that'll make more sense later in this video. As I mentioned earlier, Fenrir is Loki's son, but he's not the only one who gets to claim that lineage. See, Loki's main squeeze was a woman named Sigyn, and he had two children with her. Fali and Narfi. But his side piece was the giantess Angerbotha, and it was with her that he made his most infamous children. The youngest was Hel, and upon meeting her, Odin cast her into the underworld and made her queen of the dead, similar to how he punishes her in the Marvel movie. Only in that universe, she's Odin's daughter, not Loki's. The middle child was Jormungandr, the world serpent, who was thrown in the ocean by Odin and who would go on to have a rivalry with Thor. As his name suggests, the world serpent is massive, so massive that he could wrap himself around the entirety of Midgard and put his tail in his mouth. Makes me wonder how he would have fared in the fight against Godzilla and King Kong. Maybe in the sequel? Now the firstborn of Loki's bastards was Fenrir, and he was the only one who the Aesir gods permitted to stay in Asgard. Why did they make an exception? To this day, experts still have no idea. Some have theorized that it's because Odin has a special connection with wolves, and in fact has two of his own. Their names are Gary and Freki, which translate to greedy and hungry, and they sit by Odin at the dinner table where he feeds them his scraps because he survives on wine wine and wine alone. Listen, buddy, I know you like that idea, but I can't survive on just wine. I'm sorry. 
Anyway, that is just a theory, and unfortunately, the real explanation for why he was raised there will most definitely remain a mystery to us. That being said, we do know the story behind Fenrir's excommunication from Asgard, so let's break it down. So as you might expect, the myth that details the binding and abandonment of Fenrir can be found in one of our two major resources for Norse mythology, the Prosetta by Snorri Sturluson, specifically in the section called Gilfaginning. When the three kings, High, Justice High, and Third, who are all really Odin in disguise, explain the origins of Loki's children to King Gilfi, like I just did for you last section, they spend the most time detailing the Aesir's experience with Fenrir. Like I said, they raised him in Asgard for a time, but it wasn't long before they started to worry about his size and strength. It seemed like every day Fenrir was getting bigger and stronger, and given that they knew about the prophecy that said he would cause them great pain and suffering at Ragnarok, they agreed the best course of action would be to tie him up somewhere and abandon him. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, or that's the best way to make sure he comes back for you with a vengeance. But that's what's so interesting about the Norse gods. They're just as flawed as humans and make as many mistakes as we do. So one day, a group of Aesir approach Fenrir and suggest playing a little game. They'll bind him up in chains, and if he's strong enough to break them, he'll gain fame and renown across the Nine Realms. That sounded like a pretty sweet deal to Fenrir, who was confident in his abilities, so they chained him up with a restraint called Lading, and he shattered it without breaking a pant. You know, because dogs don't sweat. Soon after this, they tried a second restraint on Fenrir. This one was called Dromi and was one half stronger than Lading. Once again, they told the famous monster that breaking this chain would make him even more famous, and while he was hesitant, he figured he'd grown enough since last time they played that he could get out of it. Lo and behold, Fenrir was right. He broke Dromi just as easily as he did Lading, and this led to the creation of Norse proverbs, like dash out of Dromi and get loose out of Lading, which were used when someone accomplished something extremely extremely difficult. Well, at this point, the Aesir realized they were in some deep sh** if they couldn't find a way to keep Fenrir at bay. So they went to some dwarves in Svartalfheim and asked them to make a fetter that was truly unbreakable, which they did using six ingredients. The footsteps of a cat, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the saliva of birds. And as you may have figured out, none of these things actually exist in nature, and that's what gave the new fetter, called Glepnir, its strength. The Aesir then took Fenrir to an island called Lingvi, which was surrounded by the Lake Amsfartner, and told them that if he could break their new restraint, his fame would grow tenfold. But he was starting to have his doubts, because this new restraint wasn't your typical chain. It was a smooth silk band, and Fenrir knew this would either be an easy task that wouldn't gain him any fame, or the Aesir were setting him up with something that was deceptively difficult, maybe even impossible. Either way, he wasn't interested. It wasn't until the Aesir started calling him a coward and his pride was put on the line that he finally consented, but only under the condition that one of the gods would put their hand in his mouth as insurance. Well, of course, they were not a fan of that idea, especially when you consider what they were planning, but someone had to step up for the good of their race, and that someone was Tyr, who you can think of as one of the Norse gods of war. Tyr also just so happened to be the only one of the Aesir brave enough to feed Fenrir as he grew, so it's no surprise that he was the one who volunteered. He placed his hand in the monster's mouth as they tied the silk band around him. Then, as Fenrir tried to break free, he found that it was not only impossible, but the more he struggled, the stronger the silken bands got. As the anger and frustration came over Fenrir's face, the Aesir started to laugh and when they knew he was never going to succeed, they laughed even more. The only one of them who kept a straight face was Tyr, whose right hand was bitten clean off. After they recovered from that big barrel of laughs that included one of their own being dismembered, the Aesir tied the restraint around some massive boulders which they buried deep in the earth to ensure the hound would never escape. And while Fenrir continued to put up as much of a fight as he could, one of the gods shoved a sword into his mouth so that it would permanently stay open. This made an immense amount of saliva pour from his mouth and formed the River Vaughn, the source of the nickname I mentioned last section. And it was in this place, on the island of Lingvi, that Fenrir would stay until the dawn of Ragnarok, when all the bindings in the world, including his, would be destroyed. 
So if you were expecting Fenrir's role in Ragnarok to be anything like what you saw in the movie, you're in for a surprise. Because instead of simply being relegated as a noble steed to the goddess of death and getting punched in the face by the Hulk before falling down an endless waterfall, Fenrir does quite a bit of damage to the Norse pantheon. At the dawn of the end of the world, the earth will shake so violently that trees will be torn up by the roots, mountains will crumble, and all bonds will be broken, setting the famous monster free. Then he'll let out a howl that sends fear into the hearts of even the bravest Aesir and devour the shining sun, while his son, Hati Hrothvitnesen, finally catches the prey he was pursuing and devours the moon. Now those of you who are a little more familiar with Norse mythology might be wondering why I said that Fenrir devours the sun when earlier in the Prozetta, another wolf named Skull was said to be the one pursuing it. Well, it turns out that Skull and Fenrir might just be the same figure. Not really sure how that makes sense considering that Fenrir was supposedly in chains his whole life and wouldn't have been able to chase the sun around, but it wouldn't be the first time Norse mythology contradicted itself. Anyway, after swallowing the sun, Fenrir and the forces of hell will meet the Aesir on the battlefield where he fights with Odin, and this is a fight that he'll ultimately win when he devours the Allfather with his massive and terrifying mouth. Worry not though, because Odin will soon be avenged by his son Vithar, who wears a massive shoe made from the excess leather that humans discard when crafting their own footwear. A weird detail to mention, but the reason I bring it up is that he'll use said shoe to prop Fenrir's mouth open before shoving his sword down the beast's throat and stabbing him directly in the heart, ending his life. Now, if you were to judge the text at face value, this would be the entirety of Fenrir's role at Ragnarok. However, there are some interesting points to consider when you take the other wolves into account. For example, the Prozetta also states that Tyr, the god who lost his hand to Fenrir, will fight a wolf named Garmer, who's said to have been chained up in hell until now. Not only does that description sound a hell of a lot like Fenrir, but it would make perfect sense for Tyr to want revenge on him given their history, right? I mean, you could argue this wouldn't make sense because Tyr and Garmer are foretold to kill each other and Fenrir is supposed to be killed by Vithar, but as we just saw, contradictions are abundant in Snorri's work largely due to the fact that so much of the Norse religion was shared orally instead of being written down, which led to a variety of nuanced differences between the regions it was practiced in. Regardless, as you can see, Fenrir was a force to be reckoned with, and if it weren't for him, the battle at Ragnarok could have gone a completely different way, which begs the question. If the Aesir were in fact aware of the prophecy, why didn't they just kill Fenrir when he was still a puppy? Well, there's two reasons. As a puppy, he was raised in Asgard, which the gods consider too holy and sacred to defile with such a violent act. And also, look how cute wolf puppies are. If I told you that thing was gonna burn your house down in 20 years, would you be able to snuff it out? That is a question I genuinely wanna hear the answer to, as well as your thoughts on everything else we talked about today. So make sure to leave a comment down below. Then if you enjoyed the messed up origins of Fenrir and wanna see more content like it in your sub box and recommended feed, consider giving those like and subscribe buttons a little love tap. Anyone who wants to stay updated on messed up origins news, like when new videos are coming out and what they'll be about, should follow me on social media. That's also the best backup for when your sub box doesn't feel like telling you when I upload, which is concerningly often. And because he still hasn't gotten enough screen time today, Gunther wanted me to tell you to follow him and his sister on Instagram. He may be a big old chunk, but he promises he'll never eat the sun or the king of the gods because he's a very good boy. I'll see you all again soon with even more messed up content. Until then, thank you all so much for watching. My name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.